Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Robert. Uh, today's Tuesday, so in the United States at least, that means new releases day. And I have seven titles that look interesting that are coming out today, so I wanted to share those with you. Uh, the first one is a history work. It's called American Apartheid, The Native American Struggle for Self-Determination and Inclusion by Stephanie Woodard. In recent years, events such as the siege at Standing Rock and the Dakota Access Pipeline have thrust the plight of Native Americans into the public consciousness. Taking us beyond the headlines, American Apartheid offers the most comprehensive and compelling account of the issues and threats that Native Americans face today, as well as their heroic battle to overcome them. Author Stephanie Woodard details the ways in which the federal government, states, and counties curtail Native voting rights, which in turn keeps tribal members from participating in policymaking surrounding education, employment, rural transportation, infrastructure projects, and other critical issues affecting their communities. This system of apartheid has staggering consequences, as natives are, per capita, the population group that is most likely to be shot by police, suffer violent victimization by outsiders, be incarcerated, and have their children taken away. On top of this, indigenous people must also fight constantly to protect the sacred sites and landscapes that hold their cultural memories and connect their spirituality to the nation's mountains, plains, waterways, and coastlines. Despite these many obstacles, American Apartheid offers vivid pictures of diverse Native American communities that embody resilience, integrity, and the survival of ancient cultures. So that's called American Apartheid, the Native American Struggle for Self-Determination and Inclusion by Stephanie Woodard, out today. Uh, the other six titles are all fiction. Um, the first is simply called Brother by David Cheriandri. Um, in luminous, incisive prose, a startling new literary talent explores masculinity, race, and sexuality against a backdrop of simmering violence during the summer of 1991. One sweltering summer in the park, a housing complex outside of Toronto, Michael and Francis are coming of age and learning to stomach the careless prejudices and low expectations that confront them as young men of black and brown ancestry. While their Trinidadian single mother works double, sometimes triple shifts so her boys might fulfill the elusive promise of their adopted home, Francis helps the days pass by inventing games and challenges, bringing Michael to his crew's barbershop hangout and leading escapes into the cool air of the Rouge Valley, a scar of green wilderness where they are free to imagine better lives for themselves. Propelled by the beats and styles of hip-hop, Francis dreams of a future in music. Michael's dreams are, are of Aisha, the smartest girl in their high school, whose own eyes are firmly set on a life elsewhere. But the bright hopes of all three are violently, irrevocably thwarted by a tragic shooting and the police crack down and suffocating suspicion that follow. Honest and insightful in its portrayal of kinship, community, and lives cut short, David Chariandi's brother is an emotional tour de force that marks the arrival of a stunning new literary voice. So that's simply called Brother by David Chariandi, also out today. Uh, the, the next one is called Chariot, Chariot on the Mountain by Jack Ford. Based on little-known true events, this astonishing account from Emmy and Peabody award-winning journalist Jack Ford vividly recreates a treacherous journey toward freedom, a time when the traditions of the Old South still thrived, and is a testament to determination, friendship, and courage. Two decades before the Civil War, a middle-class farmer named Samuel Maddox lies on his deathbed. Elsewhere, in his Virginia home, a young woman named Kitty knows her life is about to change. She is one of the Maddox family's slaves and Samuel's biological daughter. When Samuel's wife Mary inherits her husband's property, she will own Kitty too, along with Kitty's three small children. Already in her 50s and with no children of her own, Mary Maddox has struggled to accept her husband's daughter, a strong-willed, confident, educated woman who works in the house and has been treated more like family than slave. 
After Samuel's death, Mary decides to grant Kitty and her children their freedom and travels with them to Pennsylvania, where she will file papers declaring Kitty's emancipation. Helped on their perilous flight by Quaker families along the Underground Railroad, they finally reach the free state. But Kitty is not yet safe. Dragged back to Virginia by a gang of slave catchers led by Samuel's own nephew, who is determined to sell her and her children, Kitty takes a defiant step, charging the younger Maddox with kidnapping and assault. On the surface, the move is brave yet hopeless, but Kitty has allies, her former mistress, Mary, and Fanny Withers, a rich and influential socialite who is persuaded to adopt Kitty's cause and uses her resources and charm to secure a lawyer. The sensational trial that follows will decide the fate of Kitty and her children and bond three extraordinary yet very different women together in their quest for justice. So that's called Chariot on the Mountain by Jack Ford. Uh, the next one I'm starting to see show up on BookTube in a lot of different places, so I'm excited about this one. Uh, it's called Fruit of the Drunken Tree by Ingrid Rojas Contreras. A mesmerizing debut set in Colombia at the height of Pablo Escobar's violent reign about a sheltered young girl and a teenage maid who strike an unlikely friendship that threatens to undo them both. Seven-year-old Chula and her older sister Cassandra enjoy carefree lives thanks to their gated community in Bogota, but the threat of kidnappings, car bombs, and assassinations hover just outside the neighborhood walls, where the godlike drug lord Pablo Escobar continues to elude authorities and capture the attention of the nation. When their mother hires Petrona, a live-in maid from the city's guerrilla-occupied slum, Chula makes it her mission to understand Petrona's mysterious ways. But Petrona's unusual behavior belies more than shyness. She's a young woman crumbling under the burden of providing for her family as the riptide of first love pulls her in the opposite direction. As both girls' families scramble to maintain stability amidst the rapidly escalating conflict, Petrona and Chula find themselves entangled in a web of secrecy that will force them both to choose between sacrifice and betrayal. Inspired by the author's own life and told through the alternating perspectives of the willful Chula and the achingly hopeful Petrona, Fruit of the Drunken Tree contrasts two very different but inextricable coming-of-age stories. In lush prose, Rojas Contreras sheds light on the impossible choices women are often forced to make in the face of violence and the unexpected connections that can blossom out of desperation. So that's Fruit of the Drunken Tree by Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Again, all of these are out today. The next one is a, a novel in translation. It's called I Didn't Talk by Beatrice Bratcher, and it's translated by Adam Morris. Um, I believe it's translated from the Portuguese, but I haven't seen the actual book yet. I'm just guessing because the story is set in Brazil. The English language debut of a master stylist, a compassionate but relentless novel about the long, dark harvest of Brazil's totalitarian rule. A professor prepares to retire. Gustavo is set to move from Sao Paulo to the countryside, but it isn't the urban violence he's fleeing. What he fears most is the violence of his memory. But as he sorts out his papers, the ghosts arrive in full force. He was arrested in 1970 with his brother-in-law, Armando. Both were vicariously tortured. He was eventually released. Armando was killed. No one is certain that he didn't turn traitor. I didn't talk, he tells himself, yet guilt is his lifelong harvest. I didn't talk pits everyone against the protagonist, especially his own brother. The torture never ends despite his bones having healed and his teeth having been replaced. And to make matters worse, certain details from his shattered memory don't quite add up. Beatrice Bratcher de depicts a life where the temperature is lower, there is no music, and much is out of view. I Didn't Talk's pariah's eye view of the forgotten small victims powerfully bears witness to their internal exile. I didn't talk, Gustavo tells himself, 
and as Bratcher honors his endless pain, what burns this tour de force so indelibly in the reader's mind is her intensely controlled voice. So that's called I Didn't Talk by Beatrice Bratcher, and it's translated by Adam Morris. The next one is called Immigrant Montana by Amitava Kumar. The author of the widely praised Lunch with a Bigot now gives us a remarkable novel reminiscent of Teju Cole, W.G. Sebald, John Berger, about a young new immigrant to the United States in search of love. Across dividing lines between cultures, between sexes, and between the particular desires of one man and the women he comes to love. The young man is Kalosh from India. His new American friends call him Kalashnikov, AK-47, or just AK. He takes it all in his stride. He wants to fit in, and more than that, to shine. In the narrative of his years at a university in New York, A.K. describes the joys and disappointments of his immigrant experience, the unfamiliar political and social textures of campus life, the indelible influence of a charismatic professor, also an immigrant, his personal history as dramatic as A.K.'s is decidedly not, the very different natures of the women he loved and of himself in and out of love with each of them. Telling his own story, A.K. is both meditative and the embodiment of the enthusiasm of youth in all its idealism and chaotic desires. His wry, vivid perception of the world he's making his own and the brilliant melding of story and reportage, anecdote and annotation, picture and text, give us a singularly engaging, insightful, and moving novel one that explores the varieties and vagaries of cultural misunderstanding, but is, as well, an impassioned investigation of love. So that is Immigrant Montana by Amitava Kumar. And the last, the last one everybody's probably already heard of, it seems to be taking uh, BookTube and the Internet by storm, and that is R.O. Kwan's The Incendiaries. A powerful, darkly glittering novel about violence, love, faith, and loss as a young Korean-American woman at an elite American university is drawn into acts of domestic terrorism by a cult tied to North Korea. Phoebe Lin and Will Kendall meet their first month at prestigious Edwards University. Phoebe is a glamorous girl who doesn't tell anyone she blames herself for her mother's recent death. Will is a misfit scholarship boy who transfers to Edwards from Bible College, waiting tables to get by. What he knows for sure is that he loves Phoebe. Grieving and guilt-ridden, Phoebe is increasingly drawn into a religious group, a secretive extremist cult founded by a charismatic former student, John Leal. He has an enigmatic past that involves North Korea and Phoebe's Korean-American family. Meanwhile, Will struggles to confront the fundamentalism he's tried to escape and the obsession consuming the one he loves. When the group bombs several buildings in the name of faith, killing five people, Phoebe disappears. Will devotes himself to finding her, tilting into obsession himself, seeking answers to what happened to Phoebe and if she could have been responsible for this violent act. The Incendiaries is a fractured love story and a brilliant examination of the minds of extremist terrorists and of what can happen to people who lose what they love most. So that's The Incendiaries by R. O. Kwan. We seem to be on a real run of um, Korean or Korean Americans uh, with fantastic novels coming out in the last couple of years, and so I'm fascinated to see how this one works out, too. Okay, so there you have seven new titles coming out today. If you've read any of these in advance copies or are reading them now that they're out in the bookstores, uh, please let me know what you think of any of them. Several of these look really interesting to me. Um, I've been kind of on a hardback buying ban for a, a while now, and so I'll be waiting for some of these to come out either at the library uh, or in paperback, and I'll pick up the ones that seem to be the most promising in paperback then. So let me know what you think of any of these uh, or anything else you think I should be looking at, and I'll talk to you again in my next video. Bye, everybody.